Good morning, Saints of First Church. It is a... Lord, I, I don't know if we're going to get started or not. I hate to break that up. That's so good. I, I hate to break that up. We're, we're thrilled to see you all this morning, especially those who are visiting with us. And we ask all of you, whether you're a first-time visitor, a long-time member, or somewhere in between, if you'll sign the registration pad that you find at the end of your road, we might have a record of your attendance with us on this Lord's Day. We'd appreciate it. We're thrilled that you're with us on this beautiful Sunday morning. I want to share with you a few announcements uh, from the Opportunities page and, first of all, from an insert. Uh, obviously, we're all sort of looking for ways that we can be uh, helpful in the recovery efforts with Hurricane Dorian. Here are a few that we've suggested for you. First of all, I want to let you know that if you wish to make a contribution for uh, relief in the Bahamas, there's a way to do that, and there's instructions for you to do that. Uh, secondly, uh, our friends out on, on the Outer Banks at Ocracoke and uh, Hatteras, Kennekee, Avon, and that area really took it, took it hard too. And there's a way for us to help them as well. Uh, you can uh, help us, uh, and, and our help will be uh, uh, doubled actually by the Youth Storm Fund. Uh, we'll be making our contributions to that, and they are matching our contributions dollar for dollar. So we think that's pretty good. And if you want to help us out with that, there's, a, there's instructions to do that. Uh, we sent several flood buckets out to the banks already. Uh, and some of you have given some supplies to send out there as well. Uh, our our uh, storm center has sent all the stuff they've got, I think, out right now. So we're going to be helping replenish that stock. Uh, during church has left the building, which is the last Sunday in October. We'll be putting new flood buckets together to, to replenish that that we've already sent out. So if you want to help with that, there's a way you can do that as well, and there's a, a, a instructions on how to, to, to write that out. Um, and so certainly we want to continue to pray for these folks, but these are some ways that we can actually be involved and do some, do some good and help some folks. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact us in the office and we'll tell you more, but I think this is pretty good uh, instruction sheet. I um, want to remind you also about the missions team fundraiser that's coming up this Wednesday from 5.30 to 7.30 over in Wesley Hall. Uh, it's going to be an Italian meal with some wonderful singing as well. And the proceeds of the meal will be going toward uh, the projects of the churches left the building. Uh, Deb, is there anything else I need to mention about the... Yes, if you would, make sure you sign up out in the hallway. I mean, you can come on that night, but uh, it will help us make sure we've got enough food if you will sign off. In the table outside the sanctuary, there's a sign-up sheet. And um, the music, we have music that night. It's a good evening. We hope that you will come, please. Thank you very much. This is our third, is this a third annual? Yes. Yeah, third annual. So we hope you'll come out and be a part of that. I uh, want to remind you also, ladies in the church, there'll be, there'll be a new Bible study starting uh, Wednesday night as well, 6.30 to 7.45. We'll be studying the book of 1 Peter. If you have any questions about that, you can contact Beth Page, and her information is here. Uh, and seniors, remember that we have uh, uh, Sam's Club meeting at noon on the 19th, which is Thursday, over at Haven's Garden. If you have any questions, you can contact Scott Wilkinson. He has his contact information here uh, as well. A couple of other things, uh, on the 29th, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after, there'll be a single service Sunday over in Wesley Hall at 10 o'clock. So we hope you'll come out and be a part of that. We'll tell you more about that next week. Also, I want to let you know, some of you may know, some of you may not, uh, one of our own, uh, Sue Brookshire, uh, joined the church triumphant on Friday uh, afternoon. Um, the service right now, it looks like it's going to be later on in the week. And we'll let you know as soon as we have everything nailed down, the church office will have that information. We'll send it out. But be in prayer for Curtis and the family as they go through this time of loss. Now, I would ask now if you would just join me in a time of, of, of silence. Eternal and everlasting God, we pause this day to give you thanks for your servant Sue Brookshire and indeed all of the members of our First Church family who particularly this year have gone on and outrun us to the Father's house. Thank you for their lasting witness. We thank you for the promise of resurrection and eternal life that as we 
turn to you by faith through grace, we can have the assurance that one day we'll all be together again and nothing will ever separate us. We ask, God, that you would comfort all who are grieved this day. We ask that you would give peace to troubled spirits. And we ask, God, that you would continue to surround and sustain us as we together make that journey to that home that you've prepared for us, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. It is a joy to see you in God's house on this beautiful Sunday morning. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. I invite you now to stand as you're able as we join together in our call to worship that you find printed in your bulletins. We rejoice because we know God's word is true. Let us join together now in the opening prayer. Ever searching, ever loving God, we come into your presence this morning mindful of the times when we are inclined to trust more in our own wisdom than in your will, when we are more apt to go our way than to follow your direction. Accept our thanks and praise for your redeeming grace that seeks out the lost and redeems the penitent. 
Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 98 in the hymnal, To God Be the Glory. standing, if you will, as we join in our Psalter for the day from Psalm 14. It's on page 746 in the back of your hymnals. Let us join together responsibly. Fools say in their hearts, there is no God. The Lord looks down from heaven on all people to see if there are any that are wise who seek after God. They have all gone astray. They are alike perverse. There is none that does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge, the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? You would confound the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge.
As God's people gather together in God's house, let us turn and exchange signs of his love and peace with one another. Shalom, my brother. Yeah, I did it. I took a nap at the beginning. Cool, that's fine, that's fine. Maybe seated. And if I could have my young disciples, or if you think you're young, that will be good enough. Or maybe if you're short, <laughs> come on down. <laughs> I will take everyone. <laughs> oh, we just have one today. That's okay. That's okay. How are you? Good. Well, I have this assortment of things in my basket today. Look at this. We'll see, this will be kind of like which one of these things doesn't belong. No, no, no. Uh, have a little, Mary had a little, a lamb, a little sheep here. Uh, have a little coin purse and uh, some silver coins in it. And then I have this set of keys because our scripture today is from the book of Matthew and you know when you look in your Bible you you go to the New Testament and we go through Matthew Mark and then Luke and so our scripture comes from the book of Luke today but notice I made the print bigger so I would not have to use my glasses today okay so Jesus here is talking to um, the leaders, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and he told them this parable, and a parable is like a story that helps illustrate something. He says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me! I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So that's the story of the lost sheep. Then in that same scripture, it goes into the parable of the lost coins. Because remember, I have silver coins in here. Uh, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins. And by the way, one of those coins was worth what, it would, what you would make in one day of work. So 10 coins was a, a, worth a lot. And if you lost one, that would be a lot of money. Uh, doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house? And by the way, their houses then were probably had a dirt floor. So can you imagine how a coin could get lost in a dirt floor? Until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Can you imagine what's going on in heaven when um, those angels and when God knows that we have asked for forgiveness of our sins? Have you ever lost anything? 
can you think of something you've lost? Have you ever lost uh, uh, maybe some money or lost something in your house? See, I lose stuff all the time. Like I put it in a really safe place and then I can't find it and I can't remember where the safe place was. Have you ever done that? Have your parents ever lost something like this? Anybody out there ever lose these? Yeah, yeah. They lose their keys all the time. Have you noticed that? Yeah. So in this story, we have um, a shepherd. And, you know, Jesus oftentimes refers to himself as the shepherd. And sometimes he is referred to as the Lamb of God. Isn't that sweet? So when that shepherd loses that one sheep, he leaves all the rest of them in the herd and goes to find that one. Aren't we so glad that, that God loves us enough that he would come looking for us? And I'm very thankful that he found me and that he found you. Okay. So let's just say a little prayer. We're going to turn and kneel right here on these little steps. You will easily get up. I may not. <laughs> so if we'll bow our heads. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus. thank you. That you found me. I was lost and now I'm found. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Judy, as always. Wonderful messages just remind us of the story and what a story it is. We come now into our time of worship where we um, give God praise before one another of the things he has done for us that we should rejoice in um, and yet also um, bear our hearts before God and lift up one another with our concerns. Um, I know uh, Pastor Ken mentioned uh, at the beginning of the service about our dear sister Sue, but I just wanted to to lift her up once again, I know she fought very hard here, and now she doesn't have to fight anymore. Though something about me told me that she loved to fight, um, and so maybe she can be fighting for us um, up in heaven. Um, other joys or concerns uh, to bring before the body this morning? Yes. I'd like to pray for my sister-in-law, Laura Weinberg. She's um, her cancer. For your sister, Laura. Cancer has returned. Thank you. Others? Um, we need to continue to pray, pray for um, Lake Collie, who looks like he might have to have further surgery. Uh, that is, of course, the um, Claire Darrow's grandson and uh, Caroline and Mark Collie's son. He's eight years old at Avery Greenville and has been there as of today, two weeks. For Blake, uh, for his young life and those who are giving all they can for him. Thank you for remembering him. Well, I'm afraid uh, our grandson Hayes had surgery on um, his leg last Monday, uh, this past Monday, and I'm just so thankful to God for the um, way he recovered and the smile on his face and um, just that this church family had been praying for him and he's at Eatonton Street Methodist in Raleigh and they did a laying on the pain service for him and I'm just so thankful and I had a chance to tell his doctor, Dr. Fitch, the surgeon, and I said, by the way, you are prayed up. <laughs> and I said, I got two big Methodist churches. So. Prayed up, I like that. Um, uh, if I may be selfish, I'd like to pray. Uh, remember my sister um, who lives in L.A. She, um, they recently moved a couple weeks ago, and this Wednesday on 9-11, early in the morning, she, she surprisingly and early gave birth to her third son, um, and it came so early they didn't even get out of the bed in the morning. So, um, but everything's fine, and they're, they're home, but, um, but uh, that's, that's how that went. <laughs> uh, and she'd kill me if I told you, but anyway. Um, remember anyway, to tell them. Yeah. I saw another one. Dip. Yes. Yeah. While we're praying and doing things to help people with overcoat, I would hope 
that we would keep in our prayers for people from the Bahamas who are in desperate need of shelter. Right. Our neighbors around the world, not just not just right next door, but everywhere that was touched. Yes. Last time I talked to Stan Friedman, Alma, who had surgery on both knees, is doing well. Alma is fine. She's doing well. She's got a little bit of work to do, yeah. uh, but she'll she's fine. Yes. One more. Anyone else have one more? That family, Bo Lewis, has been moved to Greenville as well, who has been in hospital here and um, is fighting cancer. They found a spot on his pancreas as well, and is also metastasized to his bone, so he needs deep prayer. Bo Lewis, uh, recovering from cancer. Thank you. Uh, let us now go into a time of prayer. I'll invite us to begin with a silent meditation. I will then lead us in a pastoral prayer, and then together, if we say together, the prayer our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Most holy God, we give you thanks and praise for the beauty of this day and for all the promise that it offers. We thank you for life, for joy, for every opportunity to walk with you as children of the light. An old hymn has the line, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We are all prone to wander. We have times when our hearts are completely wrapped up in your heart, and we can't imagine that we would ever astray. And then one day we wake up and wonder if we even know you at all. We feel as if we are merely going through the motions, and we may look just the same on the outside, but inside we're like a lost son, lost in a far off country. And as easily as we wander, we quickly judge others when they wander. We want everyone else to be held to high standards. We get tired of always doing your business and drawing back the wanderers to your fold. We want people to take responsibility for themselves and do right without having to be helped. And when they wander, we often act as if they should do some work on their own before they can be fully celebrated in the family. Cleanse our hearts and give us a new view of your heart, O oh God. Give us a heart like the shepherd who left 99 to go looking for one, whose heart was full of joy when he found it, who celebrated and put the sheep on his shoulders because he was happy to have found it. Help us to find our greatest joy in finding the lost. Help us to remember and perhaps to know for the first time the joy that comes from being lost and then being found by your love and grace. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespassed against us. Lead us, lead us not, not into temptation, temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine, thine is the kingdom, kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
us continue in our worship with the presentation of God's tithes, our gifts, and offerings. Remain standing, if you will, as we join together in another hymn. This will come from the supplemental hymn, The Faith We Sing. Number 2151, I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. may be seated.
God's people said, Amen. Thank you for that beautiful message in music choir. Good morning, Sons of First Church. It is a joy to see you this morning. It is good. It's good to be seen, absolutely. Our text comes to us this morning, as Miss Judy told us earlier, from the 15th chapter of Luke's Gospel. We're going to look at verses 1 to 10. If you have your Bible with you, I invite you to turn there. You may use the Pew Bible to follow along as well. I invite us all to give ear to the reading of God's Word. Now the tax collectors and sinners. You ever notice that Jesus, I mean, the, the, the gospel writer separates the tax collectors and the sinners? Tax collectors are tough people, huh? That's a separate column. Wow. Hmm. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, meaning Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he, meaning Jesus, told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Beloved, the word of God for the people of God in the house of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Ever-seeking God, we give you thanks and praise this day that you did not give up on us, that you do not give up on your children, that you seek those who are lost. We thank you that when we were playing hide-and-seek with you and with your grace, you didn't give up. You kept looking. Help us to share that good news with a world that needs it today. And we ask in this time as we feed our hearts together on your holy word that you would let us hear with joy, with concern, and with responsibility the words that you have to say to us this day. In your name we pray. Amen. I know you didn't ask. But I've got a great idea for a location for your next dream vacation. Tahiti, you say? Maybe ski trip to the Alps or exploring the outback in Australia? No, 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 no. Forget all that. There's a place almost as exciting as that and it's a whole lot closer. Pack your bags, my friends. We're headed to Scottsboro, Alabama. It's the home of the unclaimed baggage center. <laughs> In 1970, Doyle Owens bought a load of unclaimed baggage from a Washington, D.C. bus line. And he took the stuff out of the baggage, the good stuff, and sold it to people, and hence the unclaimed baggage center was born. Today, the baggage center is located in a building of 40,000 square feet, and it entertains yearly about a million visitors. Luggage from various airlines, after they have conducted exhaustive 90-day searches to reunite bags with owners 
when they can't find the owners, they sell those bags to the unclaimed baggage center, who then takes the stuff inside, sells it to the public. Things like clothing, jewelry, electronics, Prada bags, you name it, they sell it. A writer who visited the unclaimed baggage center said that visiting there was like going on an adventure. Need I say more? Seriously, how many of you have had to deal with lost luggage in your life? Oh, a lot of us. Well, you know it's not a lot of fun and games, is it? In the mid-80s, Carrie and I went north to visit her grandparents up Muskegon, Michigan way. We made it to Muskegon, but our luggage decided to take a separate vacation, apparently. Over the week, Carrie's luggage finally got there. Mine was really slow in coming. In fact, I spent a good deal of that vacation in a canary yellow terry cloth bathroom. There is an image to take with you the rest of the way, right? I think my last bag finally caught up with us when we had come back to North Carolina. But at least it didn't go to Scottsboro. And that's because I had a tag on there. I identified that, that bag as mine. I imagine more than one bag has been saved from a trip to Scottsboro because it had that tag on there. It said something to the effect of, if lost, return to. If this were only a condition that was just for bags, that'd be, that'd be frustrating to be okay, though. The truth of the matter is we all know that there are people in our world this day who also are misplaced, who are wandering, who are lost. How may they be found? How may they be reclaimed and redeemed? And what role do we as the church have to play in that process? Well, our text for today has a great deal to say to us about that. In this passage, the scribes and the Pharisees, the usual crowd, are once again murmuring after Jesus. Anybody ever murmur after you? You see folks out of the corner of your eye and they're talking to each other real quiet. Right, 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 right. You know, murmuring. Well, they're murmuring after Jesus. And they've accused Jesus, and quite rightly so, of gathering in, meeting with, and eating with sinners. And all of God's people in the sanctuary at First Church said, well, what's the big deal, Ken? Well, you have to understand, in the mind of the scribes and Pharisees, associating with sinful people and with tax collectors, was considered to be something that might defile an individual. These people are so wrong in their minds that they don't even want their shadows touching the shadows of the scribes and the Pharisees. And yet here's Jesus in a very sort of an intimate meeting. He's sitting at table with, he's eating and talking with these sinners. And the minds of the scribes and the Pharisees are thinking, isn't he supposed to be holy? Well, holy people don't do this. Well, Jesus, ever one to take advantage of an opportunity to teach, decided to teach the murmuring crowd and everybody else around him by sharing a couple of parables that deal with this idea of lost and found. He tells the story of a shepherd who has a flock of a hundred sheep. 99 of them are located right where they need to be, but there's one that's wandered off. And the shepherd leaves those 99 and goes in search of the wandering lamb. And he finds the lamb. And he puts it up on his shoulders and he carries it back and he calls his friends and neighbors and says, come on and rejoice with me. That sheep that I lost, I found him. And then Jesus tells another story about a woman who has ten coins, as Miss Judy was telling us, very much value in those coins. Perhaps this is this, the woman who saved these coins on her own. This is significant for her life, and she's lost one of them. And so she turns the house upside down looking for it, and she finds it. And she calls her friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice with me. I lost that coin, but look here, I found it. 
And Jesus concludes the story by saying that God's joy over a lost soul being found, being saved, is even greater than the people in the story. We love those stories, don't we? We'll tell them and listen to them all the time. And let's be honest, church. Deep down inside, we just love the way Jesus sticks it to that holier-than-thou crowd in a very subtle and yet powerful way. But what you and I have to understand this morning is that Jesus wants us to go deeper than the page-deep meaning of the story, to understand that he's with these sinners not out of happenstance, not just out of a circumstantial thing, but there's something serious going on here that God's people need to understand, something of a very important issue, a very eternal issue, a matter of life and death, and we need to get that straight. So what is it from the story that you and I really need to hang on to this morning? Well, thank you for asking those wonderful questions. We need to understand this morning, brothers and sisters, that there are lost people in our world. You know some of them. Some of them are run down 17 right now. There are lost people in our world. Despite the veneer of having it all together and being content and looking like their lives all together, deep down inside there are a lot of folks who are lonely, who are confused, who are unsure, who are lost, just like a wandering lamb or a misplaced coin. Some of them are even blissfully unaware of their condition. They're going down the highway of life thinking they're making good time, moving in a certain direction, all the while moving further away from the true path. Ryan Grenoble, in a July 2013 article for Huffington Post, told the story of a 67-year-old woman from Belgium named Sabine Moreau. Now, Sabine was supposed to go to Brussels and pick up a friend. This is a trip of about 90 miles in distance. But Sabine's GPS malfunctioned. And as a result, she traveled from Belgium to Croatia, a distance of about 1,000 miles. Now, she stopped periodically to get gas, take a little rest, get a little something to eat. But she crossed the border of five different countries. And she kept driving until she got to the Croatian capital of Zagreb. Her son got worried about her, called the police, and they were able to track Sabine down to, to, to get her back by looking at her banking transactions. When a Belgian reporter asked her about the trip, she said, Well, I got lost. I guess I just got distracted. There were a lot of signs along the road and I just got distracted. There's no doubt about it. Sabine Moreau was lost. And I know what you're thinking. Because I'm thinking it too. If I get to the welcome Austria sign, I got to turn around. You're thinking, like I'm thinking, how in the world could somebody miss something so obvious? And yet she did. And the truth of the matter is, there are a lot of people like Sabine Moreau in our world today, at least in a spiritual sense. They look like they got it together, but deep down inside, they're confused about what life means for them. They have anxiety about what the future holds. They're not sure of the direction of their life. They feel disquieted in their soul. They're lost. Some people are just blasting down the highway of life thinking they're making good time, but they're completely missing the signs. We have to understand, and it's not a popular term, I understand that, but we have to understand the truth that there are lost people in our world today. And we know them. Jesus also wants you and I to understand that these lost people are of great concern to God. 
Our God's heart breaks for all of his lost sheep and his lost coins. They are his and he wants them back. So much so that he sent his son Jesus to enter the highways and byways of this life to find them and to try to bring them back home again. In the September-October 2013 edition of the Interpreter magazine, the Reverend Larry Holland wrote an article in which he talked about a little boy that he once knew named Timmy. Timmy lived near him when Reverend Larry was living in central Oklahoma. Now, Timmy was born on the wrong side of the tracks, and he had a tough upbringing. But he was a boy of unbounding energy and one filled with a sense of wonder. And he formed a friendship with Larry, whom he called Mr. Larry. And he would often come by and visit. And one day, Timmy went to see Mr. Larry and asked for some help with his bicycle tire. It was going flat. And Larry said he took the tire off. He noticed the tire was cracked and that the inner tube was indeed some serious patching. And so he got to work patching the inner tube. And a short time later, little Timmy, without any self-consciousness at all, said to Larry, he said, Mr. Larry, why are you so nice to me? Larry said that question took his breath away. So he finally recovered himself and he said, well, Timmy, you're a nice boy. Why wouldn't I be nice to you? And Timmy said, well, some people ain't nice to me. Larry wrote on, he said, that little Timmy was rapidly on his way to finding his place in society, but it was a place where he considered himself more a problem than our potential. And Larry wrote and he said, no child should ever have to ask the question, why are you being so nice to me? Because God wants all of his children to flourish. You and I know people in our circle of life who feel just like little Larry, or little Timmy, excuse me, little Timmy, they feel like they're more of a problem than a potential. And yet, here we read that lost people matter to our God. That's the point Jesus is trying to make to the Pharisees and to the good people at the corner of Van Norden and 304 West 2nd Street. There are lost folks out there, and folks, those lost people matter a great deal to the God that you and I love and serve. Jesus also wants you and I to understand that we as the church, as the body of Christ, as God's own people, we are in danger of losing our focus and our purpose if we are not engaged in the lost and found work of which we read in the scriptures. Do we consider ourselves to be the people of God? Yes. Are there lost people in our world? Yes. Do these lost people matter a great deal to God? Yes. Well, if they matter to God, shouldn't they also matter to us? Now understand, we do a lot of great things as the church. A lot of important things. And we impact a lot of lives. And it's great. But all of that pales in comparison to the purpose for which God originally planted a congregation. And that is to be in the business of joining him and seeking out the lost and helping them come to find the Lord who came to find them. I want you to understand, get this straight in your head, please hear this, that no projected growth figures No increased financial giving, no building project matters more than that purpose for which we were called together in the first place. And we better get that straight. Because if we don't, there are severe implications that may be lasting. One of the great preachers of the last century was Dr. Fred Craddock. Dr. Craddock tells a story of a church that he served in East Tennessee when he was a student. He was a nice church filled with nice people. 
But he soon began to notice that there were a lot of people moving in on the other side of the track. People who were coming in to help build what is now the Oak Ridge facility there near Knoxville. Folks that weren't like most of the folks in town. And they weren't coming to his church and he thought, this is a great opportunity for outreach and evangelism and witnessing. And he went to see the board chair about it and talked about it and had a few ideas and the board chair listened and he said, those folks, uh, they wouldn't fit in here. The church then went, to pass, went on to pass a rule that said you couldn't be a member of the church unless you own property in the county. Well, Brother Fred finished school and moved on. Years later, he decided he'd go back to that same East Tennessee town to see if he could find a church. And he found the church, but there was no longer a worshiping congregation there. It was now a restaurant filled with all sorts of people enjoying the good food. And Dr. Craddock looked at his wife and said, it's a good thing this place isn't a church anymore because none of these folks would be welcome. Such is the fate for all bodies of Christ who forget the original reason that we were planted in the first place. If we will not engage in the work of lost and found, God will find a congregation who will. Nothing we do, nothing we do matters more than this. Reverend Stephen Balkum tells a story about Virginia Molnott. Uh, Virginia was an English professor and a theologian. Dr. Molnott said, one of the classes I get to teach is freshman English. And when I hand back the first paper of the semester, I always say to them, I'm handing back your paper now, but I want you to understand the grade on that paper is not for you. It is for the work that you're turning in. You see, I consider you all to be made in the image of God, and therefore you are of inestimable worth. She added, it is a great privilege and joy and a responsibility for us to tell people that they are beloved sons and daughters of God. Folks, that kind of news will change your life. I don't care if you're blowing down the four-lane highway thinking you're making good time, blissfully unaware of your sinfulness. I don't care if you're sitting there worried today knowing your life is missing something. To hear that you are a child of the King, the one who made the universe, that can change your life. And that's the work that we get to engage in. To tell people, hey, guess what? You can have the holiness you've been looking for. You can have that peace that your heart is yearning for. There is a home for you. You're not out there on your own alone. You are loved. And not only loved, but loved by the king of the universe that loved you so much, he sent his son to die so that you might be able to come home again. God, give us grace to take up that call, to go into the world, to tell those folks that you and I know, hey, guess what? You're not unclaimed anymore. Somebody's looking for you. Our Lord and Savior is looking for you, and he wants you to have abundant life. God, give us grace to take up that challenge, to share that message, to let folks know if you're lost, return home to God. For that good news, let's give thanks to God today and forevermore. Amen. Our hymn of going forth this morning is 381 in your hymnals. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us.
God bless you. I love you. Have a wonderful week. Remember all that's going on. Until we're together again, receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you all and give you peace.